Welcome to episode, uh, what is it, 64 of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. Today we are reading Catelyn X, uh, because once you, once you reach a high enough number, the Roman numerals uh, start getting easier again. Catelyn 10, a Game of Thrones. Uh, the second last Catelyn chapter in the book... I believe there is, uh, after this, we have a final POV from each of the main characters in the book before the end of the book. So we're sort of nearing uh, the sort of climactic uh, conclusion of this first book of Game of Thrones, which is exciting. Uh, but but without further ado, with barely any ado, uh, we will get right in to the text. Uh, the woods are full of whispers. So as we know uh, from earlier in this book, woods uh, can be places where spooky, secret, silent things go down, okay? There's nothing like a wood, there's nothing like a forest uh, for some kind of sneaky uh, shenanigans to go down, and this uh, chapter is no exception. Uh, moonlight is winking conspiratorially from above, uh, and and there are sounds, the sounds of the stream and the sounds of nature, but amongst those natural sounds there are the sounds of men, there is the slither of chain mail, there is the chink of spears, there are footsteps and whispers and nervous jests in hushed voices. Rob's northern army is sneaking... Uh, so what they're trying to do is they're trying to sneak up on Jamie Lannister. So we've, they did the whole play, right, the whole one-two punch, the whole fake and drive uh, of when Roos Bolton was sent against Tywin's army to get beat up, um, while the main force of Rob's army went in River Run's direction, where Jamie is, the whole sort of faint and slash the the, the, the fake and drive, right? Uh, so now they're creeping up on Jamie unawares, all sneaky-like, in the woods. Uh, yeah, so uh, Catelyn, meanwhile, is, is sitting and watching. So one of the main things that this chapter is about is, like, the perspective of women on war in this kind of society. Catelyn is not allowed to participate in this battle. She can only spectate. Uh, so we got an earlier battle in Tyrion's chapter from the warrior's point of view, from the dwarf warrior's point of view, Tyrion. Now we get a view of a battle uh, from a woman and a mother's point of view, which as we learn is rather a different point of view. Um, so Hallis Mullen is protecting Catelyn Stark. Uh, so she's not obviously in the main army itself. She's held back on a bit of a hill to just sort of, just sort of chill, sip a cocktail, kick kick back, get a tan, uh, while while the others are fighting. Not going to get much of a tan, I expect, because it is, I emphasize, night time. Uh, they did the scene in the daytime in the show. Uh, I imagine it's easier to film in the daytime, hey. Eh? Uh, but 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 here it's done in the dark, because uh, all good stealthy sneaky surprises uh, should be delivered in cover of darkness. Uh, so, um, so Catelyn's sitting and watching and Hallis Mullen is protecting her. Uh, Hallis Mullen, who is the Winterfell captain of guards since Jory died uh, so ignominiously. Uh, and Hallis Mullen is said to have a habit of pointing out the obvious. Uh, so, um, so we get to <laughs> witness that in this chapter, but, um, yeah, Catelyn's got 30 blokes standing around her, and apparently there was an argument between Catelyn and Rob over just how many men should be spent protecting Catelyn. Uh, Rob wanted 50 men, but Catelyn said only 10 would be sufficient, so both of them are very protective of each other. Catelyn wants all of the swords to be spent fighting alongside Rob to protect him and make sure this bloody battle is won, while Rob wants more men around Catelyn to protect her. So Catelyn and Rob are both trying to look out for each other, and we can see how, you know, trying to protect one means less protection for the other. Um, 
It's 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 a balance, a difficult balance. There's a tension. It's a bit like John's tension between family uh, and duty, uh, right? So like he feels the duty of the Night's Watch, but he feels uh, on a he, he he feels bound to the family of Stark. In the same way, Rob has to choose: should I devote more resources to protecting my family and my love, Catelyn, or should I devote more resources to winning this war, my duty to the North? There's always these tensions, right? Human hearts in conflict. This is like a small version of that, I think. Writ small. Page two. Uh, and and Catelyn is afraid of death, which is which is about as as reasonable a fear as one can have uh, before a battle, right? Battles are not known for their low mortality rate. Battles are perhaps uh, 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 defined by death, right? So Catelyn's right to be afraid of it. Uh, the Reaper is lurking. Catelyn says that this could kind of go any way. Uh, how Alice Mullen might die, I might die, Rob might die. No one is safe, she says. No life is certain. And that kind of says a lot about this book. I mean, Game of Thrones, in in in, in many eyes, is defined by the death of just anyone at any time, uh, which is, I think, perhaps a bit overstated. Jon Snow and Daenerys were never... All right, well, Jon Snow did die, didn't he? Yeah, all right. So, yeah, I mean, death is, death is a big part of it. Um, as... Riley Rrr, points out, by the way, uh, Rob Stark is 15 years old, which is pretty wacky to be leading an army um, at a time when most people in our own society, as Riley suggests, would be, you know, screaming insults to people on Xbox Live. I think people do grow up a lot faster in a society where, um, you know, they haven't invented being a teenager yet. You do hear that the, that that the whole concept of being a teenager, of being something in between a child and an adult, is like a recent invention. Uh, previously, you'd just sort of, you know, be a kid, but once you once you turn, you know, 14, 16, you'd be expected to man the fuck up, to become an adult, to, to start working and start having responsibilities and start producing more bloody children, because before you know, you'll be dead because the life expectancy is about 15 minutes. Uh, not so now. Now we have, now we have this whole sort of teenage period where you, where you're permitted to just sort of, just sort of fucking chill and complain and listen to bad music for half a decade until you can, you know, start doing something. And they're even starting to invent, uh, tween, tweens, teenagers, right? It's like the transitionary period between being a child and being a teenager, uh, which is a whole new market for the marketers to sell products too. So, I mean, it's all, it's all terribly complicated uh, in the real world now, eh, isn't it? But historically, and in Game of Thrones, you gotta, you gotta become an adult or you die, which is, um, rough. Anyway, um, so, uh, Catelyn describes how she must wait. She doesn't have the power to influence what's going to happen in this battle. All she can do is wait. Uh, thank you for the donation just in time. Uh, we are going to have to turn off the sound effect. I forgot to do that. Uh, but yes, the system is that all donations, questions, whatevers will be addressed uh, at the end of the stream. But thank you kindly for your donation. Um, so, uh, Catelyn describes how war for her involves a lot of waiting, uh, and she has waited for many men throughout her life. She, when she was a child, when she was a little teenage catfish, uh, she used to wait for her father, Hoster Tully, when he, when he went off to his battles, his politics, his stuff. <laughs> uh, Flaley Ryan is still trying to work out what a millennial is. Yeah, well, aren't we all? Uh, but yeah, sorry, so Catelyn was always sitting waiting for Hoster Tully, her father. Uh, her father would always tell her, Wait for me, little catfish. Stand guard in my absence, little catfish. Feed, water, water my plants while I'm gone, little catfish. 
do some house sitting for me. Look after my shit, little catfish. That's what Hosatoli would say to Cat uh, when he went off to do his shit. And so Catelyn did. Catelyn was rather a literalist as a child. Um, and Catelyn would, Catelyn would stand at the battlements of River Run where she grew up and she would wait for her father to return. She would stand vigil, which lends a sort of like religious, sacred duty sort of a feel, um, to Cat's waiting. Uh, and so she describes waiting for Hosta Tully and then she describes waiting for Brandon Stark because of course at one point in her life, Catelyn Tully was promised to marry Brandon Stark, but then he fucked off to go and get himself killed by the Mad King. Uh, so Cat- Catelyn was told to wait for him, though he never returned, of course. It was Ned who she ended up marrying, finally, and Ned made Catelyn wait too. She got married to Ned, and then Ned said, Oh, by the way, I need to go overthrow the government. Uh, won't, 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 won't be a moment, uh, just be back in a bit. Uh, and then Ned popped off to overthrow the government, and when he came back, he brought Jon Snow with him. That was after fathering Rob on Catelyn. So, so Ned and Cat Ro- got married, he squirted Rob Stark into her, and then he went off to overthrow the government, and then he came back with some other kid. And that all happened within, within the span of like a year, or, 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 or a, a short period of time in any case. Um, so the whole sort of Ned Catelyn relationship got off to a bit of a funny start before they even really got to knew e- know each other. He was off overthrowing the government like fucking V for Vendetta, you know, and she's pregnant with his child. Y- y- you'd hope that they're a good person, wouldn't you? I mean, of course, one of the sort of themes of this, of this story and this examination of medieval society is going like, wow, it sure sucks to be, to, to have to marry some random bloke who may or may not be a gigantic asshole. Um, and that must certainly have been the case for Cat, wouldn't it? Because if you're Cat and you're just sitting there going like, wow, I just married this savage northern barbarian man, this Stark of Winterfell, um... I just married this bloke after his brother just got popped off for being a crazy idiot in front of the Mad King, uh, and now I'm pregnant with his kid. I've barely known him for a week. Like you wouldn't really, and and, and you know, I mean, Ned is a frosty guy, right? I mean, Ned's Ned's got icicles coming hanging off his nutsack, right? He's a he's he's a cold boy, all right. Um, I don't think you'd you'd warm to him that quickly. I don't think you'd. I don't think he'd reveal much of his inner Ned early on. So I think as as, a, as someone just marrying Ned, you'd be sitting there going like, shit, is this guy, like, cruel and hard and cold and, and nasty-like? Or, or, or is he, like, all soft and warm inside like a Twinkie? Uh, and, of course, it is sort of the latter. Uh, but she wouldn't really know that in those early days. So she would have been sitting there with Rob inside her pregnant, uh, and Ned off overthrowing the government, and Catelyn would really just be sitting there going like, wow, I really hope, I really hope he's, he's all right. Uh, and, it, and yeah, he, he is, uh, as Stephanie Morris suggests. He, he is one of the better people you could have to marry uh, in terms of Westeros. He does seem generally really just sort of nice and considerate and honourable and sensitive. He even built a little a little sept for his catfish up in Winterfell. So, so you know, Ned's a good bloke. But as far as Cat knew at that point, could have gone a lot of different ways. Anyway, so Catelyn has waited for Hoster Tully, Catelyn has waited for Brandon Stark, Catelyn has waited for Ned Stark, and now she's waiting for Rob, that same little baby who had been, uh, who had been, uh, growing in Catelyn's belly while, while Ned was off overthrowing the government like V for Vendetta. Um... Uh, thank you kindly for the donation, Anon. Uh, we must turn off that sound effect, because it is slightly distracting. Uh, but we'll address it at the end of the episode. So, Catelyn is now waiting for Rob in the same way that she has waited for all these other men in her life, which is a crazy thing. I mean, when, when you think about it, if, at your next family gathering, just take a moment to just look around the room, look at all your little un- un- uncles and aunts and your nie- nieces and your nephews, but most importantly, look... Uh, at your mother and your grandmother and your great-grandmother and realize that each of these popped out of the other like a like a little babushka doll right or or a matroska doll or whatever that alt shift x was once corrected for 
uh, incorrect Russian terminology on the on the on those little dolls that that open up from each other. Like you open up the grandmother and it's like, whoo, it's a mother. And then you open up the mother and it's like, whoo, it's the child. Ain't that a crazy thing? Um, it's like those, um, it's like those gobstoppers, like those lollies that have the whole bunch of coloured layers, and you take off one, and then there's another. You just keep opening up, and they're just more humans. And technically, if you take it back long enough, you'll, you'll go back to the bloody apes, won't you? If, you? if you go back to the mother's mother, and the mother's mother's mother, and the mother's 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 mother, eventually you'll find a caveman, then you'll find a fish, then you'll find some kind of fucking multicellular bloblet that lived in the primordial cauldron of, of, of the earth hole or, or something, so I'm told. That's pretty impressive. That's quite a matroshka indeed, you know? The old cosmic, cosmic babushka. That's what they call it. That, that was the term that Darwin coined. Who, who was the bloke? Was it Lamarck? There, there was like, so there was Darwin, right? Who was like, yo, natural selection. That's, that's probably, it's probably something like that, honestly. And then there was this guy Lamarck who was like, around a similar time, I think, and Lamarck was like, yeah, all right, I think, look, I mean, your natural selection thing, it, it's it's a good idea, but here's how I think it actually works. Uh, I don't think it's natural selection, Lamarck said. Uh, I don't think it's that, like, the giraffes with the, with the, who randomly have, like, I don't think that giraffes are born with, like, a, a slightly higher neck than is average for giraffes, and then that giraffe is naturally selected to produce more offspring, and then its children who have slightly longer necks are the ones that survive, and so they, and so the, therefore g- giraffes gradually evolve longer necks. Lamarck thought, well, no, the way it actually works is that giraffes, with their stubby little necks, they just reach up for the higher leaves, they, they stretch, they, and, and when they do that, they physically stretch their neck a little bit. Like, like each giraffe physically stretches, just pulls the vote and, and just like a millimetre more. And then the child keeps that stretched neck. Like, like, like the act of the giraffe stretching its neck, like, is, is, is passed on to the next child. And so it's like physical... Defo- deformations of the the body are like somehow written into the gym, which is like great um but you got to ask like well how do bodybuilders work then cuz wouldn't by that same logic a massively swat like an, some kind of arnold schwarzenegger type who has like pecs on his pecs um wouldn't his ch- wouldn't a super swoll man uh, give well, probably not give birth, but father a really swole child. Wouldn't that happen, Lamarck? And then, and then, um, and then Lamarck went like, "Oh shit, you're probably right, Darwin." And then Darwin was the one who made it into the history books. So that's that's the way of it, I guess. You know, uh, in the same way that L- 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 Lamarckian evolutionary ideas were rejected in favor of Darwinian ideas, I suppose uh, they were academically selected, hey, and so the old genes were thrown out and the good ideas were kept, and that's the natural evolution of ideas, son. Bam! Look at that. That was, that was, poof. That was so, yeah. Everyone forgets Wallace. Yeah, they do. There's all these other blokes as well. Lots of genes got kicked out. But anyway, we are not going to diverge from the path today because we're on the tracks. We're in the whispering woods, yo. We're, we're talking in a hushed voice. We're ambushing Jamie Lannister. So let's creep up through the woods and get get some fucking, you know, get our stuff together. <clears throat> so Catelyn's waiting. Um, and now she's waiting for Rob in the same way that she waited for Hoster, Brandon, and Ned. Oh, repetition is something. We, we've had some more comments and criticism recently, which, which is always nice to acknowledge. Um, really, should have remembered the commenter's name, because there was a really good one, uh, that sort of parodied what, uh, this show can sound like sometimes, and repetition was one of the main criticisms, so we will try to repeat less, we will try to repeat less, we'll try to repeat less. Uh, and so, uh, Catelyn is waiting for Rob. And Rob does not give any sign of being frightened. Uh, he looks, he, he moves among the men and he's like hanging out with all of his soldiers before the thing. And he's just sort of emotionally connecting with his blokes because if you're going to send some blokes in to die for you, you better have a touching moment with them first. So their death will be all the more heart rending. 
uh, when they die. Uh, but yes, I mean, I suppose uh, the men who are fighting for Rob are probably more like to fight hard for him uh, if they feel like they actually care about their leader and their leader actually cares about him. Wouldn't it be great if, like, current current warfare was conducted like that? Wouldn't it be great uh, if, like, you know, the 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 head of state... Uh, the commander in chief, if 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 the president of the United States, uh, hu- well, they do do that, don't they? They they often have those like press events and stuff where like the the United States president will go to like an army camp uh, in the Middle East or some kind of base uh, further afield and just sort of just hang out and say hi to the soldiers and give a speech about how terribly important they are. And so I suppose yeah, in in quite the same way that we have this military leader hang hanging out. Um, Hanging out with the soldiers in medieval times, the same shit happens now with modern presidents. So the basic principle, I suppose, stands uh, that that it's that it's important for the soldiers to believe in the leader and for the leader to appear to believe in the soldiers. That's important too. Uh, and so there's a plan, by the way. There's a plot. There's a scheme, uh, and uh, there's a caper. Uh, and the plan is for for an ambush to take place against Jamie Lannister. We're not told the details yet, but the idea is that they are using Jamie's uh, impatience and rashness against him, and that's pretty much what this whole plan turns on. But we'll get more details of that soon. Uh, so Rob's hanging amongst the men, uh, and and Catelyn prays that he's going to be okay and that he'll survive. Uh, this battle. Uh, so Catelyn thinks, let Rob grow taller. Let him, let him, let him know sixteen. Let him, let him reach his sixteenth birthday. Which you wouldn't think, you wouldn't think it would be a hard ask from the gods. But the gods of Westeros are cruel, uh, and so Catelyn's begging for him to reach past the age of fifteen to sixteen. Let him reach twenty. Let him reach fifty. Let him grow as tall as his father and have his own children. Please, please, please. Uh, and of course, tragically, we know that while Rob will reach 16, he will never reach 20, and he will never hold his sons in his arms. But that's a spoiler. Um, yeah, there is a lot of, um, as as Brandon Winslow points out, Cat's chapters are often the ones with the darkest foreshadowing. Catelyn has a lot of time to sort of sit and brood and hope that things won't go awry, what with all the waiting that she does. Um... And of course, being Game of Thrones uh, awry, things often go. There's only one direction on the compass of Game of Thrones, and every compass point points to awry. It, that's just the only way to go. Uh, there's just four different ways for things to terribly fucked up to the north, we- west, east, and south. So Catelyn is praying that Rob will be okay. But at least the night is warm. At least it's not chilly. Uh, that is That is at least a plus. Um, and they think about, um, so Catelyn is waiting to see the Lannister soldiers that the the Northmen are expecting to ambush. They're waiting for some Lannisters to come by, including Jaime, uh, and, uh, and they don't expect the Lannisters to know that the Northerners are about, that there are Northerners in the woods, uh, because Brynden Blackfish, with his uh, few hundred men, uh, has been... Uh, has been screening the Northerners March by killing all of the ravens that might release messages and killing all of the scouts that they find. So theoretically the Lannisters have no idea that the Northerners are there because in this in this situation we don't yet have like satellite technological cameras and drones to like you know see everything that's happening everywhere. information warfare. the Lannisters don't know the Northerners are here. Um, and there are 12,000 blokes in Jamie Lannister's army, apparently, but they're all scattered around River Run. We're near River Run at the moment because Jamie is besieging the castle. Uh, and 12,000 men is about three times what the Northerners have. So Jamie's army is much larger, uh, but Rob has the element of surprise sneaking up. Um, and. Uh, and the Northern Army is bigger, though, than what, how big it was before. They've got some new blokes from Jason Malister. They've got some, uh, they've got some new hedge knights and uh, random individual blokes, small lords, a whole bunch of sort of bits and pieces that they've picked up. It's like uh, gravity, I suppose, that like a big 
army tends to attract gravitationally smaller forces uh, to its main bulk. And you have all these like free riders uh, and women like Shay who sort of orbit the main area. Everything sort of clumps together. Uh, it's all gravitationally bound. And then it, when it hits another object in space, that's what we call a battle. And shit gets flung into pieces. You ever hear, apparently one theory, apparently one theory about the moon, uh, moon theories, new segment, we need a moon theories theme song, uh, moon theory, one theory about the moon is that the moon was, uh, uh, created, originated, uh, when a big ass rock hit the earth, uh, apparently a Mars sized rock hit the earth. So this is like pretty early on, like certainly before um, uh, life, apparently. Um, and then this big old rock just smashed into the earth, which just blew a whole bunch of bits off the earth. And, and one of the big old bits that was knocked off the earth by this big old rock uh, was the moon. This this big old blob that, that, that just started orbiting the earth as a result after after getting smashed. Um, that's pretty crazy. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but, yeah, how do you explain the cheese, then? How do you explain the cheese? Anyway, so, um, there's a whole bunch of Jamie Lannister's blokes, there's a whole bunch of Stark blokes, uh, and Catelyn looks at Oliver Frey, who is Rob Stark's squire, uh, because remember, part of the deal with Walder Frey was that, uh, Rob had to take one of Walder's sons, uh, as a... Squire. Oliver is two years older than Rob, but he's about ten years younger and more anxious. Uh, so he's actually two years older, but he seems younger because of how anxious he is. I would be anxious too if I grew up among the Freys who are all squabbling and, and breeding like rabbits and, and, and uh, murdering each other for succession reasons. I would be nervous as a Frey too. I think. Oops, someone's brought up Nibiru uh, in the in the comments, so uh, shit's getting shit's getting real down there. Damn. Um, uh, so the so they're talking about Oliver Frey, uh, and then Catelyn looks at Rob himself, and he puts on the helmet, he puts on the gear of war, and now there is a tall young knight where her son had been. Uh, so there's something transformative about donning the garb of war. Um, uh, and there's sort of that dual identity in Catelyn's eyes between the son uh, who she'd given birth to and who she wants to protect and the man who she has to obey and who is leading an army right now. Um, uh, and and Rob says, all right, I've got to go. I've got to go hang out with the bloke some more. Uh, father says you should let the men see you before a battle. So we're constantly reminded that Rob is following Ned's example uh, in all of his politicking and his warring. Um, and... Uh, and so Rob rides off, and he's bringing Grey Wind with him, by the way, which is a pretty sick accessory to have on the field, I would say. It's like the hot new, hot new accessory. Um, you could imagine someone going down the catwalk, like, imagine, imagine someone going down a Parisian catwalk and, like, strutting, you know, strutting down the, like, Zoolander, just going... And then, and then there's like the the doggo, the grey wind, just walking behind with the same, with the same strut, but like quadrupedal, like a quadrupedal version of the catwalk strut. And then you know, then then Rob does his own, he he does the blue steel, and then and then the doggo gives his own sort of canine blue steel from the catwalk. Wouldn't that be great? I would watch the shit out of a uh, out of a man and direwolf based fashion show. Yeezy season four, no doubt. Um, and so Rob Stark has an honor guard. Rob Stark, uh, Rob Stark has like a whole bunch of blokes whose job it is to hang out with Rob and protect him. So it's a bit like the King's Guard, uh, the, the the King's Guard Seven. But in Rob's case, he doesn't fuck around. His guard is better than the King's Guard by a factor of uh, what is it? Five? What? What's seven divided by whatever? Math. Fuck math. But the point is, he's got a whole bunch of blokes whose job it is to guard him, uh, including people like Torrent Carstark, uh, Eddard and Eddard, uh, Eddard Carstark, Patrick Malister, Small John Umber, Hornwood, Theon Greyjoy, a bunch of Walder Freys. A, a, a lot of the sons of the lords uh, are in Rob Stark's honor guard. So he's got a whole bunch representing a whole di- bunch of different places in the north, including Daisy Mormont, by the way. 
who Catelyn notes is a woman, which is unusual. Uh, Daisy is a is a female warrior. Uh, Lady Mage's daughters and Mage herself, the She Bears, uh, are all female warriors, uh, and they're all um, they're all fairly impressive specimens. Although some of the other lords mutter about that that there's a woman on the guard. Um, so so some fairly overt uh, sexism from some of those lords. Um, but Catelyn, Catelyn argues that, well, look, this hasn't got anything to do with whatever your values are about, you know, only men on the honor guard or whatever. This is about simple pragmatism. Daisy can swing a morning star, so she belongs in the guard. Um, so, you know, pragmatism over bigotry every time, I suppose. Um, uh, but Catelyn is worried. Is it going to be enough? Um, hey, let's not attack my math abilities. Jesus, Stephanie is savage. Uh, anyway, uh, so Catelyn's like, will it be enough? Are we going to be okay? Um, ooh, snow shrikes. We got some snow shrikes in the woods, uh, uh, people, because uh, because we're doing some bird calls. We're doing some classic, like a classic trope of like sneaky movies, right, is that when you're creeping through the woods in order to single to each other, You've got to do some animal noises. You've got to go like, cuckoo, cuckoo, or like whatever the fuck, to like communicate to each other without giving away uh, the position, or the, uh, without giving away that you're people. I mean, you can't go, hey, Sven, I think it's time to do the secret attack now. Like, you can't do that. You've got to like say it in bird talk. You've got to say like, hoot, 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 you know? Uh, and then they'll have no idea. Uh, that's, that's what real sneaky people do, uh, and so these northerners make the sound of a snow shrike, which is apparently some kind of a bird. Uh, a shrike, it, that is a real-world bird, isn't it? A real-world animal, I think. Uh, but it sounds like something rather more impressive. Shrike, it sounds like a weapon, almost. It sounds like something sharp and pointy. A shrike sounds like something you would not want to find uh, in your car seat when you're stumbling home after a night. Uh, you would not want to bump into a shrike on a dark alleyway, would you? Uh, but um, but that's the sound that the northerners make. What does the fox say? Well, the northerners say, shrike, shrike. Anyway, uh, they are coming, Catelyn thinks. Uh, so they've they've detected that Jamie Lannister is coming, uh, who they are trying to ambush. Um, and... and uh, I still haven't explained what the plan is, but I'll just explain it now. So the plan is basically, uh, so Rob Stark snuck up near River Run, where Jamie Lannister's army is, but instead of attacking like their whole army, uh, they're going to attack like a smaller force that Jamie is leading. Because what they did is that they did a little misdirectorino, uh, and they attacked a small uh, holding, hold fast castle fortification that the Lannisters were holding uh, with Tully arms again. So not even to to let the Lannisters know that the Northerners are about. Um, Attacking a little holdfast on the assumption that Jaime Lannister himself would personally lead the attack against it to retake it. Uh, so they're relying on their assumptions about Jaime's uh, rashness and keenness for battle by assuming that Jaime will come to the fight, will come to the diversion when they attack this little holdfast. And when he does come uh, with, his, with his small group of blokes, they'll attack him uh, and capture Jaime Lannister. That's the goal. Uh, and so when Jamie Lannister turns up, that's what uh, that's what the plan becomes. Um, so Jamie Lannister uh, is sighted by Catelyn. Uh, she sees the gold of his hair shining in the moonlight, glimpses him between the trees, um, and uh, and he doesn't wear a helmet because, of course, Jamie Lannister is far too pretty to wear a helmet. It would be a crime for such pretty hair to be hidden beneath the helmet, and so Jamie Lannister lets his locks uh, hang out for all to see. Um, and, uh, and yeah, because this was uh, Brynden Blackfish's plan, apparently, uh, to, uh, to draw out Jamie uh, and then attack him, and so they do. Uh, and so then uh, Rob glances at Catelyn one last time and rides off to battle, to spring the trap. The old Akbar, the old admiral, um, and as Firmus points out, that yeah, a lot of people don't wear helmets 
in the Game of Thrones show, which makes sense, I suppose, so that you can recognize the actors. Why would you pay millions of dollars for a pretty face like Nicolas Walter Costo or, or, or Amelia Clark and then hide their pretty face beneath a bunch of steel? Um, that, that would be a bit of a waste of a face, and we can't have any face wastage, can we? Um, so, yeah, that's probably it. Uh, but in, in the books, people are wearing helmets all the time. They've got all these really, you know, practical, utilitarian helmets, like, like the Narwhal Knight, Flemont Brax, really, really just sensible helmets. Every second helmet in the books, uh, is, um, is wearing some animal-themed, animal-shaped helmet, uh, in the show, when they do have helmets, they're usually a bit more sensible. Except for, except for the Hound, because that one is, um, that one is, uh, far too cool to exclude. Um, so, they're gonna spring the Trapperino, uh, and so Grey Wind howls. Uh, so that's kind of the, um, the symbol, the, the signal for the attack to start, and what a symbol it is. We've, we've just used, like, the snow shrikes for the people to communicate, uh, the, the, that was a subtle signal, uh, and that was a northern bird. Now we're using a northern wolf to finally signal the true attack. Uh, and yeah, quite, quite a sound it is. Uh, and so, and the sound sounds to Catelyn terrible and frightening, but with a certain music in it, uh, which rather sounds like a description of the whole series, to be honest. Uh, the whole series is a bit frightful and a bit terrifying. Uh, death, Catelyn relates it to, but... Within all of the terror and horror, uh, there is music in it too. I would say that there is music in the series amidst all the suffering and horror as well. Maybe that's what the Song of Ice and Fire is. A Song of Ice and Fire, I dare say, would sound frightening, but no doubt there'd be a certain music in it. Um, and so Rob rides off to battle, and so all the horns blow, and so all of the northerners who are set up to, ready to spring their, their, their frosty trap, uh, they're all sitting around and they all blow their war horns now that the signal has blown, uh, and they're ready to attack, and so they let fly their arrows, and the spearmen pick up their spears, and they scream Winterfell, and they charge into battle against Jaime and his Lannisters, and Catelyn, meanwhile, sits on her horse and waits. So the contrast there between all of the northern men and, well, and people like Daisy springing into action while Catelyn sits on her horse, stock still, and waits. Um, so she watches and she waits and she hears the sounds. Uh, she can't see the battle, uh, but from amongst the trees she can hear the sounds. She hears the weapons clashing, she hears people crying Lannister and Winterfell and Tully. They're always doing that in, in fantasy medieval novels, aren't they? They're always doing these battle cries um, about where they come from. I don't suppose modern soldiers do a lot of that, do they? Um, uh, but, uh, but I suppose part of it is just trying to be absolutely clear which side you're on, because uh, in the scrummage of a medieval battle, it might be easy to mistake a mate for a foe, wouldn't it? Um, probably makes it easier to change sides as well, if you have to. I mean, if things start going against you, you could sort of say one thing now and then start shouting another later on, if it is that you need to do an old switcheroo. Uh, and, you know, there's no shame in a switcheroo if you're, if you're about to lose, because uh, losing in this game means death. Uh, so the battle begins, uh, and, and Catelyn listens to the sounds. She listens to the men fighting and dying and cursing and begging for mercy and, uh, and shouting and everything starts going down until eventually the battle ends and a red, and a red dawn breaks. And Grey Wind begins to howl to signal the end of the battle, just as he signaled the beginning. Uh, and then Rob rides back, and this is kind of how the how the how this bit begins in the show. Uh, in the show, this scene is much much shorter, and again, we don't see we don't see any uh, fighting. Uh, so season one of Game of Thrones manages to pass without a single battle actually being filmed in order to save all of the all of the. Uh, all of the budget that would be necessary to engineer something like that. And so Rob Stark rides back, as he does in this show, uh, and he looks a bit banged up, but he's alive. And then Catelyn goes, oh no, you're hurt, because there's blood all over him, and then Rob's like, eh, it's not my blood. 
Don't worry about it. Some other fucker's blood. Uh, apparently, it's Torin Stark's blood, possibly. Uh, Torin Karstark, because Torin was killed, which becomes a bit of a plot point later on. Um, but they survived, and then all the blokes file back, um, coming back to Catelyn like a like a proud dog carrying a bone or something. Look what I found. Ugh. You know, that's how the blokes sort of come back up the hill and say, Look, Catelyn, we did a battle. Hooray. Um, so they all file back, and they're grinning, and they're happy. Theon and the Great Joy and all these blokes, and between them, they drag back Jamie Lannister. You know, like when a cat will bring, like, a dead mouse to you? Like, cats are always so bloody, so bloody proud when they bring back some awful dead thing that now you have to fucking, you know, pick up through a plastic bag and chuck out. Um, in the same way that a cat brings back a kill, the Northerners bring back the captured Jamie Lannister, which is rather a prize to win. Um, and, uh, and Hellas Mullen unnecessarily announces with his talent for stating the obvious, Oi, that's Jamie Lannister, the Kingslayer. He's like the Greek chorus or something, or he's like the announcer or the herald who sort of goes, you know, that's the sun, it burns hot so that plants can grow. You know, just always sort of unnecessary tooltips pointing out everything you could possibly want to know. Um, and, uh, and Jamie's like, ah, g'day, Catelyn, how's it doing? I would pledge you my sword, but I seem to have lost my sword, and Catelyn's like, I don't want your sword, I want my family back. Uh, I want my father Hoster, I want my brother Edmure, I want my daughters Sansa and Arya, and I want my husband Eddard Stark. Uh, and Jamie says, I seem to have mislaid them as well, must have left them in my other jacket. Must be in my other pantaloon pockets. I do not have your family, I'm afraid. And so Catelyn goes, shit. <laughs> uh, and Theon says, kill him. Kill Jamie. Just knock off his head right now. Uh, because, of course, Theon is a fucking idiot. Uh, and Rob's like, well, no, we're not just going to destroy our most valuable strategic asset. We're going to capture him uh, and we're going to be able to use him in some kind of negotiation. We might be able to swap him for one of our family members. Uh, of course, what ends up happening is that Catelyn releases Jamie herself, which was not in, a, in itself a very smart thing to do. But, but anyway, they've just captured Jamie Lannister. Uh, and Rob mentions that Lord Karstark will want Jamie's head on a pike because Jamie killed Karstark's son, uh, Torrin and Eddard. Uh, and of course, that in itself becomes a really big deal later on because after Catelyn frees Jamie, Karstark gets rather upset, and so he kills uh, he kills Martin and and what's his face Lannister, these young Lannister cousins, which oh fucking clusterfuck. Rob has to cut off Karstark's head, but we'll we'll, we'll get to that anyway. Uh, so they've captured Jamie, uh, and um, and they talk about some of the things that happened in the battle. Uh, so uh, so Jamie was courageous during the battle. He tried to come and ro- run down Rob Stark, uh, but Rob Stark was uh, protected uh, by the Car Stark boys. One of the Car Stark boys is called Eddard, and Jamie uh, put his sword through Eddard Car Stark's neck, which you got to wonder if that might be foreshadowing of uh, another Eddard. Eddard Stark's beheading when a sword goes through his neck. Rather the same thing. We have an Eddard being beheaded uh, only chapters before our other Eddard gets beheaded. I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, uh, and Catelyn says, well, that sucks, Blokes died, but there's no time for grief. Uh, we gotta, we gotta keep rolling, you know? Um, so, you know, Catelyn, when her own, when her own family members die, she finds time for grief then. Uh, but uh, she urges that this is a battle, and we got to stay pragmatic. Uh, we've won a battle, but not a war. And then Theon says, but what a battle. Like, we, we've done so well. We've captured a whole bunch of Lords Bannermen. We've, ha- we've captured a whole bunch of Lords of the Westerlands. This is not... There is, Westeros has not seen such a victory since the Field of Fire, Theon declares, which is probably, probably a little bit of an overstatement. But... Uh, it was apparently a big, ba- a big victory for the Northmen. Um, uh, but Catelyn points out, well, we still haven't captured uh, Tywin Lannister, and if we haven't got Tywin Lannister, this war is not yet over. Uh, so, so the next step now uh, is River Run, and that's how the chapter ends. Uh, so, 
this chapter is about waiting in some ways. It's about uh, Catelyn's perspective on the war, uh, a woman's perspective on the war, and on sort of broader society, uh, in that the women can't directly participate, women like uh, women like Daisy Mormont can, uh, but uh, Catelyn Stark is not able to directly participate in the, in, 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 in the battling, so she is forced to wait, and so we see some of the emotions and some of the difficulties that arise from that. Uh, rather a ki- rather a different kind of difficulty than the difficulties faced by the likes of Tor and Stark, who have you know Jamie's gilded sword passing through their fucking aorta. Uh, that's a bit of an issue too. Uh, but we also get to see Catelyn's perspective on this conflict. Uh, and what we'll do now is we'll respond to some questions and comments and such uh, from donors. Uh, so just in time. Uh, made a donation, and he said, I really enjoy your streams. Number 64 is my first live one. You're you're a good bloke, mate. As to my question, what good things do you think that Cersei has done for anyone ever? I'm asking literally, not rhetorically. Uh, That is quite a good question, I think. Uh, Because one of the things that uh, a certain alt shift X was attempting with the recent Cersei Lannister video uh, was attempting for some kind of sympathy uh, towards Cersei. Cersei is kind of demonized by a lot of the fandom, uh, I think. Uh, But I think if you look at her closely, there's there's a bit more uh, hashtag nuance going on, and I think it's worth taking a look at her character. But uh, that's not to say that she isn't a giant cunt. Uh, and I think that's what Justin Time alludes to, uh, by asking what, what, what did she ever do for anyone? Like the Romans in Monty Python, and it's a good question. I think, uh, one thing that you can point out, uh, or at least one thing that I think Cersei would say is that she's, uh, is that she's done things for her family. She's done things specifically for Tom and Joffrey and Marcella. Uh, but, of course, that's questionable because, she, you know, she is a pretty awful mother and an abusive mother by some definitions. Uh, so it's questionable whether she's done anything good to them. Uh, she might also argue that she's done good things uh, for House Lannister by, by you know, sort of fighting for them uh, by, uh, I suppose, you know, with Ned Stark... Cersei dealt with Ned Stark during his attempted takeover of uh, the Crown and King's Landing, which you could argue is good for, uh, which is good for her children because otherwise Robert would have found out that her children weren't his, and so he would have killed them. But I mean, Cersei's motivation there was self-interest, largely. I think it's fair to say, um, pretty much everything she does ever is out of self-interest. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's I think that's a great point. I think it is quite possibly the case that Cersei has pretty much never done anything in this series to the benefit of anyone but herself. Does anyone have any ideas in the comments? Let me have a glance at the comments. Has anyone got an example of Cersei actually doing something nice for someone else? Uh doesn't seem so. Maybe I'd have. I'll, maybe if I think of something next episode, I'll 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 mention it. Uh, but yeah, great question, just in time. That is a great point. I, I I think there is pathos, and I think there is interesting, sympathetic things going on in Cersei's life. But uh, she is profoundly self-interested, as well as cruel, uh, and and as well as dumb in a lot of ways. Um, so so yeah, great point, just in time. Uh, and we also had, uh, was there, was there a second donation? There was one from Anon as well. So thank you, Anon. Um, so, all right, I think that covers all of the official business, uh, on the agenda. Uh, just, all right, right, oh, here's something else to mention. Uh, so, all right, so something with, like, this live streaming thing is an interesting experiment, right? I think it's an interesting thing to play around with. Uh, but I think it needs to be done differently in order to work best, I think. So the way it works at the moment is that there's this there's this river of comments, this fast moving stream. And in order to try and interact with it, you just sort of gotta like reach out and dip your hand into this torrent that's blowing by and sort of reach and hope to grab onto something interesting that you can 
respond to. Uh, I don't think that's the ideal way to interact with a sort of ongoing conversation. Uh, Do you guys have any suggestions on some way that you can have a live conversation online uh, which can be responded to in real time? That's my question. I think uh, what, what came to my mind was some kind of a Reddit conversation. Like, what if you had a Reddit post, which was like the Reddit post for this episode of Alt Swift X or whatever, uh, and then and then you could upvote and downvote comments during the episode live, uh, and then I could respond to whatever comments rise to the top of the post. Would that make sense? I'm not sure if that would work in real time, but couldn't you? upvote and downvote live, and so then the, the the comments would sort of be sort of self-moderated by you guys. Yeah, I, I also like the idea, Riley, of um, having like a Discord channel where you could have actual voice, like you guys uh, could actually like, like yeah, like a call-in radio show. That would be cool, uh, where you could have you guys talking on voice. Yeah, Twitter feed, Twitter feed has the same problem of just being like a timeline, um, but... Um, Oh, does Google Hangout have upvoting questions? Is that a thing? But yeah, some kind of a Reddit thing, I think, would make sense. Does anyone else have any suggestions? Um, Yeah, all right. I think the Reddit thing makes sense. So I think maybe for the next episode, we will try having, like, an official post on the old ShriftX subreddit, I suppose. Um, And you all can just comment on the post and you can just sort of upvote, downvote what sort of questions and comments you want responded to. Um, And then I can respond to those at more sort of like designated points throughout the stream. Because the problem is now, like, if something interesting comes up in the stream, I've got to interrupt the flow in order to respond to it, which sometimes sucks. Um, Oh, and yeah, by the way, I'm not suggesting like turning off these live comments or anything. I think we'll leave uh, these comments as they are. Um, but it m- might be nice to additionally have the Reddit thing. Oh, does does History of Westeros... What does History of Westeros do? I haven't seen any of their live streams. Um, yeah, because as, as uh, Gamma Grennan points out, uh, it is quite difficult to talk and think at the same time. It hurts. It is like an ADD simulator, guys. It is... Trying trying to talk and compose thoughts live, improvised, and respond to what people are saying live is really fucking hard. So yeah, some kind of subreddit. All right, uh, all right. I think we will, I think we will conclude things here. Uh, so thank you all for participating in this live stream in this episode of Alt with X's Game of Thrones abridged. I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, and yeah, next episode, look out for some kind of a link uh, f- to some kind of a post where we can have some kind of a chat. Um, yeah, I'll have to, hopefully, does History of Westeros uh, broadcast the t- the live streams afterwards? I'll have to have a watch afterwards to see what they do. Um, but yeah, all right. So thank you all, and have a lovely day, and uh, we will have a new episode soon. Cheers. <laughs>